Peril at End House by Agatha Christie Chapter 1 The Majestic Hotel No seaside town in the south of England is, I think, as attractive as St. Lou. It is well named the Queen of Watering Places, and reminds one forcibly of the Riviera. The Cornish coast is to my mind every bit as fascinating as that of the south of France. I remarked as much to my friend Hercule Poirot. So it said on our menu in the restaurant car yesterday, mon ami. Your remark is not original. But don't you agree? He was smiling to himself, and did not at once answer my question. I repeated it. Oh, a thousand pardons, Hastings. My thoughts were wandering, wandering indeed, to that part of the world you mentioned just now. The south of France? Yes. I was thinking of that last winter that I spent there, and of the events which occurred. I remembered. A murder had been committed on the blue train, and the mystery, a complicated and baffling one, had been solved by Poirot with his usual unerring acumen. How I wish I'd been with you, I said with deep regret. I too, said Poirot. Your experience would have been invaluable to me. I looked at him sideways. As a result of long habit, I distrust his compliments. But he appeared perfectly serious. And after all, why not? I have a very long experience of the methods he employs. What I particularly missed was your vivid imagination, Hastings. He went on dreamily. One needs a certain amount of light relief. My valet Georges, an admirable man with whom I sometimes permitted myself to discuss a point, has no imagination whatever. This remark seemed to me quite irrelevant. Tell me, Poirot, I said, are you never tempted to renew your activities? This passive life suits me admirably, my friend. To sit in the sun, what could be more charming? to step from your pedestal at the zenith of your fame. What could be a grander gesture, they say of me, that is Hercule Poirot, the great, the unique. There was never anyone like him, there never will be. Eh bien, I am satisfied. I ask no more. I am modest. I should not myself have used the word modest. It seemed to me that my little friend's egotism had certainly not declined with his years. He leaned back in his chair, caressing his moustache and almost purring with self-satisfaction. We were sitting on one of the terraces of the majestic hotel. It is the biggest hotel in St. Lou and stands in its own grounds on a headland overlooking the sea. The gardens of the hotel lay below us, freely interspersed with palm trees. The sea was of a deep and lovely blue, the sky clear and the sun shining with all the single-hearted fervour an August sun should, but in England so often does not have. There was a vigorous humming of bees, a pleasant sound, and altogether nothing could have been more ideal. We had only arrived last night, and this was the first morning of what we proposed should be a week's stay. If only these weather conditions continued, we should indeed have a perfect holiday. I picked up the morning paper, which had fallen from my hand, and resumed my perusal of the morning's news. The political situation seemed unsatisfactory but uninteresting. There was trouble in China. There was a long account of a rumoured city swindle, but on the whole there was no news of a very thrilling order. "'Curious thing, this parrot disease,' I remarked, as I turned the sheet. "'Very curious. Two more deaths at Leeds, I see. Most regrettable.' I turned a page. "'Still no news of that flying fellow, Seaton, in his round-the-world flight. Pretty plucky, these fellows.' That amphibian machine of his, the albatross, must be a great invention. Too bad if he's gone west. Not that they've given up hope yet. He may have made one of the Pacific Islands. The Solomon Islanders are still cannibals, are they not? inquired Poirot pleasantly. Must be a fine fellow. That sort of thing makes one feel it's a good thing to be an Englishman after all. It consoles for the defeats at Wimbledon, said Poirot. Oh, I... I didn't mean... I began... My friend waved my attempted apology aside gracefully. Me, he announced, I am not amphibian like the machine of the poor Captain Seaton, but I am cosmopolitan, and for the English I have always had, as you know, a great admiration. The thorough way, for instance, in which they read the daily paper. My attention had strayed to political news. 
They seem to be giving the Home Secretary a pretty bad time of it, I remarked with a chuckle. The poor man. He has his troubles, that one, ah, yes, so much so that he seeks for help in the most improbable quarters. I stared at him. With a slight smile, Poirot drew from his pocket his morning's correspondence, neatly secured by a rubber band. From this he selected one letter which he tossed across to me. It must have missed us yesterday, he said. I read the letter with a pleasurable feeling of excitement. But Poirot, I cried, this is most flattering. You think so, my friend? He speaks in the warmest terms of your ability. He is right, said Poirot, modestly averting his eyes. He begs you to investigate this matter for him. Puts it as a personal favour. Quite so. It is unnecessary to repeat all this to me. You understand, my dear Hastings, I have read the letter myself. It's too bad, I cried. This will put an end to our holiday. No, no. Calmez-vous. There is no question of that. But the Home Secretary says the matter is urgent. He may be right. Or then again, he may not. These politicians, they are easily excited. I have seen myself in the Chambre des Députés in Paris. Yes, yes, but Poirot, surely we ought to be making arrangements. The express to London is gone. It leaves at twelve o'clock. The next... Calm yourself, Hastings. Calm yourself, I pray of you. Always the excitement, the agitation. We are not going to London today, nor yet tomorrow. But this summons does not concern me. I do not belong to your police force, Hastings. I am asked to undertake a case as a private investigator. I refuse. You refuse? Certainly. I write with perfect politeness, tender my regrets, my apologies. Explain that I am completely desolated, but what will you? I have retired. I am finished. You are not finished, I exclaimed warmly. Poirot patted my knee. There speaks the good friend, the faithful dog. And you have reason, too. The grey cells, they still function. The order, the method, it is still there. But when I have retired, my friend, I have retired. It is finished. I am not a stage favourite who gives the world a dozen farewells. In all generosity, I say, let the young men have a chance. They may possibly do something creditable. I doubt it, but they may. Anyway, they will do well enough for this doubtless tiresome affair of the Home Secretary's. But Poirot, the compliment, me, I am above compliments. The Home Secretary, being a man of sense, realizes that if he can only obtain my services, all will be successful. What will you? He is unlucky. Hercule Poirot has solved his last case. I looked at him. In my heart of hearts I deplored his obstinacy. The solving of such a case, as was indicated, might add still further luster to his already worldwide reputation. Nevertheless, I could not but admire his unyielding attitude. Suddenly, a thought struck me, and I smiled. I wonder, I said, that you're not afraid. Such an emphatic pronouncement will surely tempt the gods. Impossible he replied, that anyone should shake the decision of Hercule Poirot. Impossible, Poirot. Mm, you are right, mon ami. One should not use such a word. <laughs> Et ma foi. I do not say that if a bullet should strike the wall above my head, I would not investigate the matter. One is human, after all. I smiled. A little pebble had just struck the terrace beside us, and Poirot's fanciful analogy from it tickled my fancy. He stooped now and picked up the pebble as he went on. Yes, one is human. One is uh, the sleeping dog. Well and good. But the sleeping dog can be roused. There is a proverb in your language that says so. In fact, I said, if you find a dagger planted by your pillow tomorrow morning, let the criminal who put it there beware. He nodded, but rather absently. Suddenly, to my surprise, he rose and descended the couple of steps that led from the terrace to the garden. As he did so, a girl came inside, hurrying up towards us. I had just registered the impression that she was a decidedly pretty girl, when my attention was drawn to Poirot, who, not looking where he was going, had stumbled over a root and fallen heavily. He was just abreast of the girl at the time, and she and I between us helped him to his feet. My attention was naturally on my friend, but I was conscious of an impression of dark hair, an impish face, and big, dark blue eyes. <laughs> a thousand pardons, 
stammered Poirot. Mademoiselle, you are most kind. Uh, I regret exceedingly. Ow! Oh! Ah! My foot! Uh, he pains me considerably. Uh, no, no, no. It is nothing, really. The, the turned ankle, that is all. In a few minutes all will be well. But if you could help me, Hastings, you and Mademoiselle between you, if she will be so kind, I am ashamed to ask it of her. With me on one side and the girl on the other, we soon got Poirot onto a chair on the terrace. I then suggested fetching a doctor, but this, my friend, negative sharply. It is nothing, I tell you. The ankle turned, that is all. Painful for the moment, but uh, soon over. He made a grimace. See, in a little minute I shall have forgotten. Mademoiselle, uh, I thank you a thousand times. You are most kind. Sit down, uh, I beg of you. The girl took a chair. It's nothing, she said. But I wish you'd let it be seen to. Mademoiselle, I assure you, it is a bagatelle. In the pleasure of your society, the pain passes already. The girl laughed. <laughs> That's good. What about a cocktail? I suggested. It's just about the time. Well, she hesitated. Thanks very much. Martini? Uh, yes, please. Uh, dry martini. I went off. On my return, having ordered the drinks, I found Poirot and the girl engaged in animated conversation. Imagine, Hastings, he said. That house there, uh, the one on the point that we have admired so much, it belongs to Mademoiselle here. Indeed, I said, though I was unable to recall having expressed any admiration. In fact, I'd hardly noticed the house. It looks rather eerie and imposing, standing there by itself, far from anything. It's called End House, said the girl. I love it. But it's a tumble-down old place, going to rack and ruin. You are the last of an old family, Mademoiselle? Oh, we're nothing important. But there have been Buckleys there for two or three hundred years. My brother died three years ago, so I'm the last of the family. Oh, that is sad. You live there alone, mademoiselle? Oh, uh, I'm away a good deal, and when I'm at home there's usually a cheery crowd coming and going. <laughs> that is so modern. Me, I was picturing you in a dark, mysterious mansion, haunted by a family curse. How marvellous! What a picturesque imagination you must have! No, it's not haunted. Or, if so, the ghost is a beneficent one. I've had three escapes from sudden death in as many days, so I must bear a charmed life. Poirot sat up alertly. Escapes from death? That sounds interesting, mademoiselle. Oh, they weren't very thrilling. Just accidents, you know. She jerked her head sharply as a wasp flew past. Oh, curse these wasps! There must be a nest of them round here. The bees and the wasps, you do not like them, mademoiselle. You have been stung, yes? No, but I hate the way they come right past your face. The bee in the bonnet, said Poirot. Your English phrase. At that moment the cocktails arrived. We all held up our glasses and made the usual inane observations. I'm due in the hotel for cocktails, really, said Miss Buckley. I expect they're wondering what's become of me. Poirot cleared his throat and set down his glass. Ah, for a cup of good, rich chocolate, he murmured. But in England they make it not. Still, in England you have some very pleasing customs. The young girls, their hats come on and off so prettily, so easily. The girl stared at him. What do you mean? Why shouldn't they? You ask that because you are young, so young, mademoiselle. But to me, the natural thing seems to have a coiffure high and rigid. So, and the hat attached with many hatpins. La, 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 et la. He executed four vicious jabs in the air. <laughs> but how frightfully uncomfortable. Ah, I should think so, said Poirot. No martyred lady could have spoken with more feeling. When the wind blew, it was agony. It gave you the migraine. Miss Buckley dragged off the simple, wide-brimmed felt she was wearing and cast it down beside her. And now we do this, she laughed which is sensible and charming, said Poirot with a little bow. I looked at her with interest. Her dark hair was ruffled and gave her an elfin look. There was something elfin about her altogether. The small, vivid face, pansy-shaped, the enormous dark blue eyes, and something else, something haunting and arresting. Was it a hint of recklessness? There were dark shadows under the eyes. The terrace on which we were sitting was a little used one. 
The main terrace, where most people sat, was just round the corner, at a point where the cliff shelved directly down to the sea. From round this corner now there appeared a man, a red-faced man with a rolling carriage, who carried his hands half clenched by his sides. There was something breezy and carefree about him, a typical sailor. "'I can't think where the girls got to,' he was saying in tones that easily carried to where we sat. "'Nick! Nick!' Miss Buckley rose. "'I knew they'd be getting in a state. Attaboy, George, here I am. "'Freddy's frantic for a drink. Come on, girl!' He cast a glance of frank curiosity at Poirot, who must have differed considerably from most of Nick's friends. The girl performed a wave of introduction. "'This is, uh, Commander Challenger. Um—' But to my surprise, Poirot did not supply the name for which she was waiting. Instead, he rose, bowed very ceremoniously, and murmured, "'Of the English Navy. I have a great regard for the English Navy.' This type of remark is not one that an Englishman acclaims most readily. Commander Challenger flushed, and Nick Buckley took command of the situation. "'Oh, come on, George, don't gape. Let's find Freddy and Jim.' She smiled at Poirot. "'Thanks for the cocktail.' I hope the ankle will be all right. With a nod to me, she slipped her hand through the sailor's arm, and they disappeared round the corner together. So, that is one of Mademoiselle's friends, murmured Poirot thoughtfully, one of her cheery crowd. What about him? Give me your expert judgment, Hastings. Is he what you call a, a good fellow, yes? Pausing for a moment, to try and decide exactly what Poirot thought I should mean by a good fellow— I gave a doubtful assent. Oh, seems all right, yes, I said, so far as one can tell by a cursory glance. I wonder, said Poirot. The girl had left her hat behind. Poirot stooped to pick it up, and twirled it round absent-mindedly on his finger. He has a tendresse for her. What do you think, Hastings? <laughs> My dear Poirot, how can I tell? Here, give me that hat. The lady will want it. I'll take it to her. Poirot paid no attention to my request. He continued to revolve the hat slowly on his finger. Pas encore. Ça m'amuse. Really, Poirot? Yes, my friend. I grow old and childish, do I not? This was so exactly what I was feeling that I was somewhat disconcerted to have it put into words. Poirot gave a little chuckle. Then, leaning forward, he laid a finger against the side of his nose. But no, I am not so completely imbecile as you think. We will return the hat, but assuredly, but later. We will return it to End House, and thus we shall have the opportunity of seeing the charming Miss Nick again. Poirot, I said, I believe you've fallen in love. She is a pretty girl, eh? Well, you saw for yourself, why ask me? Because, alas, I cannot judge. To me nowadays, anything young is beautiful. Jeunesse, jeunesse. It is the tragedy of my years, but you... I appeal to you. Your judgment is not up to date, naturally, having lived in the Argentine so long. You admire the figure of five years ago, but you are at any rate more modern than I am. She is pretty, yes? She has the appeal to the sexes? One sex is sufficient, Poirot. The answer, I should say, is very much in the affirmative. Why are you so interested in the lady? Am I interested? <laughs> well, look at what you've just been saying. You are under a misapprehension, mon ami. I may be interested in the lady, yes, but I am much more interested in her hat. I stared at him, but he appeared perfectly serious. He nodded his head at me. Yes, Hastings, this very hat. He held it towards me. You see the reason for my interest? Well, it's a nice hat, I said, bewildered, but quite an ordinary hat. Lots of girls have hats like it. Not like this one. I looked at it more closely. You see, Hastings? A perfectly plain fawn felt. Good style. I did not ask you to describe the hat. It is plain that you do not see. Almost incredible, my poor Hastings, how you hardly ever do see. It amazes me every time I knew. But regard, my dear old imbecile, it is not necessary to employ the grey cells. The eyes will do. Regard. Regard. And then at last I saw to what he had been trying to draw my attention. The slowly turning hat was revolving on his finger, and that finger was stuck neatly through a hole in the brim of the hat. When he saw that I had realized his meaning, he drew his finger out 
and held the hat towards me. It was a small, neat hole, quite round, and I could not imagine its purpose, if purpose it had. Did you observe the way Mademoiselle Nick flinched when a bee flew past? The bee in the bonnet, the hole in the hat. But a bee couldn't make a hole like that. Exactly, Hastings. What acumen! It could not. But a bullet could, mon cher. A bullet? Mais oui. A bullet like this. He held out his hand with a small object in the palm of it. A spent bullet, mon ami. It was that which hit the terrace just now when we were talking. A spent bullet. You mean... I mean that one inch of a difference, and that hole would not be through the hat, but through the head. Now, do you see why I am interested, Hastings? You were right, my friend, when you told me not to use the word impossible. Yes, one is human. Ah, but he made a grave mistake, that would-be murderer, when he shot at his victim within a dozen yards of Hercule Poirot. For him it is, indeed, la mauvaise chance. But you see now why we must make our entry into End House and get into touch with Mademoiselle. Three near escapes from death in three days. That is what she said. We must act quickly, Hastings. The peril is very close at hand. Chapter 2 End House Poirot, I said. I've been thinking. An admirable exercise, my friend. Continue it. We were sitting facing each other at lunch at a small table in the window. This shot must have been fired quite close to us, and yet we did not hear it. And you think that in the peaceful stillness, with the rippling waves, the only sound, we should have done so? Well, it's odd. No, it is not odd. Some sounds, you get used to them so soon that you hardly notice they are there. All this morning, my friend, speedboats have been making trips in the bay. You complained at first. Soon you did not even notice. But, ma foi, you could fire a machine gun, almost, and not notice it when one of those boats is on the sea. Yes, that's true. Ah, voilà, murmured Poirot. Mademoiselle and her friends, they are to lunch here, it seems. And therefore, I must return the hat. But no matter. The affair is sufficiently serious to warrant a visit all on its own. He leapt up nimbly from his seat, hurried across the room, and presented the hat with a bow, just as Miss Buckley and her companions were seating themselves at table. They were a party of four. Nick Buckley, Commander Challenger, another man, and another girl. From where we sat we had a very imperfect view of them. From time to time the naval man's laugh boomed out. He seemed a simple, likable soul, and I already had taken a fancy to him. My friend was silent and distray during our meal. He crumbled his bread, made strange little ejaculations to himself, and straightened everything on the table. I tried to talk, but meeting with no encouragement, soon gave up. He continued to sit on at the table long after he had finished his cheese. As soon as the other party had left the room, however, he too rose to his feet. They were just settling themselves at a table in the lounge when Poirot marched up to them in his most military fashion and addressed Nick directly. Mademoiselle, may I crave one little word with you? The girl frowned. I realized her feelings clearly enough. She was afraid that this queer little foreigner was going to be a nuisance. I could not but sympathize with her, knowing how it must appear in her eyes. Rather unwillingly, she moved a few steps aside. Almost immediately, I saw an expression of surprise pass over her face at the low, hurried words Poirot was uttering. In the meantime, I was feeling rather awkward and ill at ease. Challenger, with ready tact, came to my rescue, offering me a cigarette and making some commonplace observation. We had taken each other's measure and were inclined to be sympathetic to each other. I fancied I was more his own kind than the man with whom he had been lunching. I now had the opportunity of observing the latter. A tall, fair, rather exquisite young man, with a rather fleshy nose and overemphasized good looks. He had a supercilious manner and a tired drawl. There was a sleekness about him that I especially disliked. Then I looked at the woman. She was sitting straight opposite me in a big chair, and had just thrown off her hat. She was an unusual type. A weary Madonna describes it best. She had fair, almost colorless hair parted in the middle, and drawn straight down over her ears to a knot in the neck. Her face was dead white and emaciated, yet curiously attractive. 
Her eyes were very light grey, with large pupils. She had a curious look of detachment. She was staring at me. Suddenly she spoke. Uh, sit down. Till your friend has finished with Nick. She had an affected voice, languid and artificial, yet which had a curious attraction, a kind of resonant, lingering beauty. She impressed me, I think, as the most tired person I'd ever met, tired in mind, not in body, as though she found everything in the world to be empty and valueless. A Miss Buckley very kindly helped my friend when he twisted his ankle this morning, I explained as I accepted her offer. So Nick said. Her eyes considered me, still detachedly. Nothing wrong with his ankle now, is there? I felt myself blushing. Oh, just a momentary sprain, I explained. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear Nick didn't invent the whole thing. She's the most heaven-sent little liar that ever existed, you know. Amazing. It's quite a gift. I hardly knew what to say. My discomfiture seemed to amuse her. She's one of my oldest friends, she said, and I always think loyalty is such a tiresome virtue, don't you? Principally practised by the Scots, like thrift and keeping the Sabbath. But Nick is a liar, isn't she, Jim? That marvellous story about the brakes of the car, and Jim says there was nothing in it at all. The fair man said in a soft, rich voice, I know something about cars. He half turned his head. Outside, amongst other cars, was a long red car. It seemed longer and redder than any car could be. It had a long, gleaming bonnet of polished metal. A supercar. Is that your car? I asked, on a sudden impulse. He nodded. Yes. I had an insane desire to say it would be. Poirot rejoined us at that moment. I rose. He took me by the arm, gave a quick bow to the party, and drew me rapidly away. It is arranged, my friend. We are to call on Mademoiselle at End House at half past six. She will be returned from the motoring by then. Yes, yes, surely she will have returned. In safety. His face was anxious, and his tone was worried. What did you say to her? I asked her to accord me an interview as soon as possible. She was a little unwilling, naturally. She thinks I can see the thoughts passing through her mind. Who is he, this little man? Is he the bounder, the upstart, the moving picture director? If she could have refused, she would, but it is difficult. Asked like that on the spur of the moment, it is easier to consent. She admits that she will be back at six-thirty. Saye. I remarked that that seemed to be all right, then. But my remark met with little favour. Indeed, Poirot was as jumpy as the proverbial cat. He walked about our sitting-room all the afternoon, murmuring to himself and ceaselessly rearranging and straightening the ornaments. When I spoke to him, he waved his hands and shook his head. In the end, we started out from the hotel at barely six o'clock. It seems incredible, I remarked, as we descended the steps of the terrace, to attempt to shoot anyone in a hotel garden. Only a madman would do such a thing. I disagree with you. Given one condition, it would be quite a reasonably safe affair. To begin with, the garden is deserted. The people who come to hotels are like a flock of sheep. It is customary to sit on the terrace overlooking the bay. Eh bien, so everyone sits on the terrace. Only I, who am an original, sit overlooking the garden. And even then, I saw nothing. There is plenty of cover. You observe trees, groups of palms, flowering shrubs. Anyone could hide himself comfortably and be unobserved whilst he waited for Mademoiselle to pass this way. And she would come this way. To come round by the road from End House would be much longer. Mademoiselle Nick Buckley, she would be of those who are always late and taking the shortcut. All the same, the risk was enormous. He might have been seen. And you can't make shooting look like an accident. Not like an accident, no. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. A little idea. I may or may not be justified. Leaving it aside for a moment, there is what I mentioned just now, an essential condition. Which is? <laughs> Surely you can tell me, Hastings. I wouldn't like to deprive you of the pleasure of being clever at my expense. Oh, the sarcasm, the irony. Well, what leaps to the eye is this. The motive cannot be obvious. If it were, why then, truly, the risk would indeed be too great to be taken. People would say, 
I wonder if it was so-and-so. Where was so-and-so when the shot was fired? No, the murderer, the would-be murderer, I should say, cannot be obvious, and that, Hastings, is why I am afraid. Yes, at this minute I am afraid. I reassure myself. I say, there are four of them. I say, nothing can happen when they are all together. I say, it would be madness, and all the time I am afraid. These accidents, I want to hear about them. He turned back abruptly. It is still early. We will go the other way, by the road. The garden has nothing to tell us. Let us inspect the orthodox approach to End House. Our way led out of the front gate of the hotel and up a sharp hill to the right. At the top of it was a small lane with a notice on the wall, To End House Only. We followed it, and after a few hundred yards the lane gave an abrupt turn and ended in a pair of dilapidated entrance gates, which would have been the better for a coat of paint. Inside the gates to the right was a small lodge. This lodge presented a piquant contrast to the gates and to the condition of the grass-grown drive. The small garden round it was spick and span. The window frames and sashes had been lately painted, and there were clean, bright curtains at the windows. Bending over a flower bed was a man in a faded Norfolk jacket. He straightened up as the gate creaked and turned to look at us. He was a man of about sixty, six foot at least, with a powerful frame and a weather-beaten face. His head was almost completely bald. His eyes were a vivid blue and twinkled. He seemed a genial soul. "'Good afternoon,' he observed as we passed. I responded in kind, and as we went on up the drive I was conscious of those blue eyes raking our backs inquisitively. I wonder, said Poirot thoughtfully. He left it at that without vouchsafing any explanation of what it was that he wondered. The house itself was large and rather dreary-looking. It was shut in by trees, the branches of which actually touched the roof. It was clearly in bad repair. Poirot swept it with an appraising glance before ringing the bell, an old-fashioned bell that needed a Herculean pull to produce any effect, and which, once started, echoed mournfully on and on. The door was opened by a middle-aged woman, a decent woman in black. So I felt she should be described. Very respectable, rather mournful, completely uninterested. Miss Buckley, she said, had not yet returned. Poirot explained that we had an appointment. He had some little difficulty in gaining his point. She was the type that is apt to be suspicious of foreigners. Indeed, I flatter myself that it was my appearance which turned the scale. We were admitted, and ushered into the drawing-room, to await Miss Buckley's return. There was no mournful note here. The room gave on the sea and was full of sunshine. It was shabby, and betrayed conflicting styles. Ultra-modern, of a cheap variety, superimposed on solid Victorian. The curtains were of faded brocade, but the covers were new and gay, and the cushions were positively hectic. On the walls were hung family portraits— some of them, I thought, looked remarkably good. There was a gramophone, and there were some records lying idly about. There were a portable wireless, practically no books, and one newspaper flung open on the end of the sofa. Poirot picked it up, then laid it down with a grimace. It was the St. Lou Weekly Herald and Directory. Something impelled him to pick it up a second time, and he was glancing at a column when the door opened and Nick Buckley came into the room. "'Bring the ice, Ellen,' she called over her shoulder, then addressed herself to us. "'Well, here I am, and I've shaken off the others. I'm devoured with curiosity. Am I the long-lost heroine that is badly wanted for the talkies? You were so very solemn,' she addressed herself to Poirot, "'that I feel it can't be anything else. Do make me a handsome offer.' "'Alas, mademoiselle,' began Poirot. "'Oh, don't say it's the opposite,' she begged him. "'Don't say you paint miniatures and you want me to buy one.' But no, with that moustache, and staying at the Majestic, which has the nastiest food and the highest prices in England, no, it simply can't be. The woman who had opened the door to us came into the room with ice and a tray of bottles. Nick mixed cocktails, expertly, continuing to talk. I think at last Poirot's silence, so unlike him, impressed itself upon her. She stopped in the very act of filling the glasses and said sharply, Well, that is what I wish it to be, well. Mademoiselle. He took the cocktail from her hand. To your good health, Mademoiselle. 
to your continued good health. The girl was no fool. The significance of his tone was not lost on her. Is anything the matter? Yes, mademoiselle. This. He held out his hand to her with the bullet on the palm of it. She picked it up with a puzzled frown. You know what that is? Well, yes, of course I know. It's a bullet. Exactly, mademoiselle. It was not a wasp that flew past your face this morning. It was this bullet. Do you mean, was some criminal idiot shooting bullets in a hotel garden? It would seem so. Well, I'm damned, said Nick frankly. I do seem to bear a charmed life. That's number four. Yes, said Poirot. That is number four. I want Mademoiselle to hear about the other three accidents. She stared at him. I want to be very sure, Mademoiselle, that they were accidents. Why, of course. What else could they be? Mademoiselle, prepare yourself, I beg, for a great shock. What if someone is attempting your life? Nick's response to this was a burst of laughter. The idea seemed to amuse her hugely. What a marvellous idea! My dear man, who on earth do you think would attempt my life? I'm not the beautiful young heiress whose death releases millions. I wish somebody was trying to kill me. That would be a thrill, if you like. But I'm afraid there's not a hope. Will you tell me, mademoiselle, about those accidents? Of course. But there's nothing in it. They were just stupid things. There's a heavy picture hangs over my bed. It fell in the night. Just by pure chance I had happened to hear a door banging somewhere in the house and went down to find it and shut it. And so I escaped. It probably would have bashed my head in. That's number one. Poirot did not smile. Continue, mademoiselle. Let us pass on to number two. Oh, that's weaker still. There's a scrambly cliff path down to the sea. I go down that way to bathe. There's a rock you can dive off. A boulder got dislodged somehow and came roaring down, just missing me. The third thing was quite different. Something went wrong with the brakes of the car. I don't know quite what. The garage man explained, but I didn't follow it. Anyway, if I'd gone through the gate and down the hill, they wouldn't have held, and I suppose I'd have gone slap into the town hall, and there would have been a devil of a smash. Slight defacement of the town hall, complete obliteration of me. But owing to my always leaving something behind, I turned back and merely ran into the laurel hedge. And you cannot tell me what the trouble was? Or you can go and ask them at Mott's garage. They'll know. It was something quite simple and mechanical that had been unscrewed, I think. I wondered if Ellen's boy, my standby who opened the door to you has got a small boy, had tinkered with it. Boys do like messing about with cars. Of course, Ellen swore he'd never been near the car. I think something must have worked loose in spite of what Mott said. Where is your garage, mademoiselle? Around the other side of the house. Is it kept locked? Nick's eyes widened in surprise. Oh, no, of course not. Anyone could tamper with the car unobserved? Well, yes, I suppose so. But it's so silly. No, mademoiselle, it is not silly. You do not understand. You are in danger. Grave danger. I tell it to you, I. And you do not know who I am. No, said Nick breathlessly. I am Hercule Poirot. Oh, said Nick in a rather flat tone. Oh. Yes. You know my name, eh? Oh, yes. She wriggled uncomfortably. A hunted look came into her eyes. Poirot observed her keenly. You are not at ease. That means, I suppose, that you have not read my books. Uh, well, uh, no, uh, not all of them. <laughs> but I know the name, of course, mademoiselle. You are a polite little liar. I started remembering the words spoken at the Majestic Hotel that day after lunch. I forget. You are only a child. You would not have heard. So quickly does fame pass. My friend there, he will tell you. Nick looked at me. I cleared my throat, somewhat embarrassed. <coughs> Monsieur Poirot is, um, uh, was, uh, a great detective, I explained. Ah, my friend, cried Poirot. Is that all you can find to say? Mais dis donc. Say then to mademoiselle that I am a detective unique, unsurpassed, the greatest that ever lived. That is now unnecessary, I said coldly. You have told her yourself. 
Ah, yes, but it is more agreeable to have been able to preserve the modesty. One should not sing one's own praises. One should not keep a dog and have to bark oneself, agreed Nick with mock sympathy. Who is the dog, by the way? Dr. Watson, I presume? My name is Hastings, I said coldly. Battle of 1066, said Nick. Who said I wasn't educated? Well, this is all too, too marvellous. Do you think someone really wants to do away with me? It would be thrilling. But, of course, that sort of thing doesn't really happen. Only in books. I expect Monsieur Poirot is like a surgeon who's invented an operation, or a doctor who's found an obscure disease and wants everyone to have it. Sacré tonnerre! thundered Poirot. Will you be serious? The young people of today will nothing make you serious? It would not have been a joke, mademoiselle, if you had been lying in the hotel garden, a pretty little corpse with a nice little hole through your head instead of your hat. You would not have laughed then, eh? Huh? Unearthly laughter heard at a seance, said Nick. But seriously, Monsieur Poirot, it's very kind of you and all that, but the whole thing must have been an accident. You are as obstinate as the devil. Well, that's where I got my name from. My grandfather was popularly supposed to have sold his soul to the devil. Everyone round here called him Old Nick. He was a wicked old man, but great fun. I adored him. I went everywhere with him, and so they called us Old Nick and Young Nick. My real name is Magdala. Well, that is an uncommon name. Yes, it's a kind of family name. There have been lots of Magdalas in the Buckley family. There's one up there. She nodded at a picture on the wall. Ah, said Poirot. Then, looking at a portrait hanging over the mantelpiece, he said, Is that your grandfather, mademoiselle? Yes. Rather an arresting portrait, isn't it? Jim Lazarus offered to buy it. I wouldn't sell. I've got an affection for old Nick. Ah. Poirot was silent for a minute. Then he said very earnestly, Revenons à nos moutons. Listen, mademoiselle, I implore you to be serious. You are in danger. Today, somebody shot at you with a Mauser pistol. A Mauser pistol? For a moment she was startled. Yes. Why, do you know of anyone who has a Mauser pistol? She smiled. I've got one myself. You have? Yes, it was Dad's. He brought it back from the war. It's been knocking round here ever since. I saw it only the other day in that drawer. She indicated an old-fashioned bureau. Now, as though suddenly struck by an idea, she crossed to it and pulled the drawer open. She turned rather blankly. Her voice held a new note. Oh, she said, it's... it's gone. Chapter 3 Accidents? It was from that moment that the conversation took on a different tone. Up to now, Poirot and the girl had been at cross-purposes. They were separated by a gulf of years. His fame and reputation meant nothing to her. She was of the generation that knows only the great names of the immediate moment. She was therefore unimpressed by his warnings. He was to her only a rather comic elderly foreigner with an amusingly melodramatic mind. And this attitude baffled Poirot. To begin with, his vanity suffered. It was his constant dictum that all the world knew Hercule Poirot. Here was someone who did not. Very good for him, I could not but feel, but not precisely helpful to the object in view. With the discovery of the missing pistol, however, the affair took on a new phase. Nick ceased to treat it as a mildly amusing joke. She still treated the matter lightly, because it was her habit and her creed to treat all occurrences lightly, but there was a distinct difference in her manner. She came back and sat down on the arm of a chair, frowning thoughtfully. "'That's odd,' she said. Poirot whirled round on me. "'You remember, Hastings, the little idea I mentioned? Well, it was correct, my little idea. Supposing Mademoiselle had been found shot, lying in the hotel garden. She might not have been found for some hours. Few people pass that way, and beside her hand, just fallen from it, is her own pistol. Doubtless the good Madame Ellen would identify it. There would be suggestions, no doubt, of worry or of sleeplessness. Nick moved uneasily. <laughs> That's true. I have been worried to death. Everybody's been telling me I'm nervy. Yes, they'd all say that. And bring in a verdict of suicide. 
Mademoiselle's fingerprints conveniently on the pistol and nobody else's, but yes, it would be very simple and convincing. How terribly amusing, said Nick, but not, I was glad to note, as though she were terribly amused. Poirot accepted her words in the conventional sense in which they were uttered. N'est-ce pas? But do you understand, mademoiselle, there must be no more of this. Four failures, yes, but the fifth time there may be a success. Bring out your rubber-tired hearses, murmured Nick. But we are here, my friend and I, to obviate all that. I felt grateful for the we. Poirot has a habit of sometimes ignoring my existence. Yes, I put in. You mustn't be alarmed, Miss Buckley. We will protect you. How frightfully nice of you, said Nick. I think the whole thing's perfectly marvellous, too, too thrilling. She still preserved her airy, detached manner, but her eyes, I thought, looked troubled. And the first thing to do, said Poirot, is to have the consultation. He sat down and beamed upon her in a friendly manner. To begin with, mademoiselle, a conventional question. But have you any enemies? Nick shook her head rather regretfully. I'm afraid not, she said apologetically. Bon, we will dismiss that possibility then. And now we ask the question of the cinema, of the detective novel. Who profits by your death, mademoiselle? I can't imagine, said Nick. That's why it all seems such nonsense. There's this beastly old barn, of course, but it's mortgaged up to the hilt. The roof leaks, and there can't be a coal mine or anything exciting like that hidden in the cliff. It is mortgaged, huh? Yes, I had to mortgage it. You see, there were two lots of death duties, quite soon after each other. First my grandfather died, just six years ago, then my brother. That just about put the lid on the financial position. And your father? He was invalided home from the war, then got pneumonia, and died in 1919. My mother died when I was a baby. I lived here with grandfather. He and dad didn't get on. I don't wonder— so Dad found it convenient to park me and go roaming the world on his own account. Gerald, that was my brother, didn't get on with Grandfather either. I dare say I shouldn't have got on with him if I'd been a boy. Being a girl saved me. Grandfather used to say I was a chip off the old block and had inherited his spirit. She laughed. He was an awful old rip, I believe, but frightfully lucky. There was a saying round here that everything he touched turned to gold. He was a gambler, though, and gambled it away again. When he died, he left hardly anything beside the house and the land. I was sixteen when he died, and Gerald was twenty-two. Gerald was killed in a motor accident just three years ago, and the place came to me. And after you, mademoiselle, who is your nearest relation? Oh, my cousin, Charles. Charles Weiss. He's a lawyer down here. Quite good and worthy, but very dull. He gives me good advice and tries to restrain my extravagant tastes. He manages your affairs for you, eh? Huh? Well, yes, if you like to put it that way. I haven't many affairs to manage. He arranged the mortgage for me and made me let the lodge. Ah, the lodge. I was going to ask you about that. It is let? Yes, to some Australians. Croft, their name is. Very hearty, you know, all that sort of thing. Simply oppressively kind, always bringing up sticks of celery and early peas and things like that. They're shocked at the way I let the garden go. They're rather a nuisance, really, at least he is. Too terribly friendly for words. She's disabled, poor thing. Lies on a sofa all day. Anyway, they pay the rent. That's the great thing. How long have they been here? Oh, uh, about six months. I see. Now, beyond this cousin of yours... On your father's side, or your mother's, by the way? Mother's. My mother was Amy Vise. Bien. Now, beyond this cousin, as I was saying, have you any other relatives? Uh, some very distant cousins in Yorkshire. Buckley's. No one else? No. Well, that is lonely. Nick stared at him. Lonely? What a funny idea. I'm not down here much, you know. I'm usually in London. Relations are too devastating as a rule. They fuss and interfere. It's much more fun to be on one's own. I will not waste the sympathy. You are a modern, I see, mademoiselle. Now, your household. <laughs> How grand that sounds. Ellen's the household. And her husband, who's a, a sort of gardener. Not a very good one. I pay them frightfully little because I let them have the child here. Ellen does for me when I'm down here, and 
If I have a party, we get in who and what we can to help. I'm giving a party on Monday. It's regatta week, you know. Monday, and today is Saturday. Yes. Yes. And now, mademoiselle, your friends, the ones with whom you were lunching today, for instance. Well, um, Freddy Rice, the fair girl, is practically my greatest friend. She's had a rotten life, married to a beast, a man who drank and drugged and was altogether a queer of the worst description. She had to leave him a year or two ago. Since then, she's drifted round. I wish to goodness she'd get a divorce and marry Jim Lazarus. Lazarus? Uh, the art dealer in Bond Street? Yes. Jim's the only son, rolling in money, of course. Did you see that car of his? And he's devoted to Freddy. They go about everywhere together. They're staying at the Majestic over the weekend, and are coming to me on Monday. And Mrs. Rice's husband? The mess? Oh, he's dropped out of everything. Nobody knows where he is. It makes it horribly awkward for Freddy. You can't divorce a man when you don't know where he is. Évidemment. Poor Freddy, said Nick pensively. She's had rotten luck. The thing was all fixed once. She got hold of him and put it to him, and he said he was perfectly willing, but he simply hadn't got the cash to take a woman to a hotel. So the end of it all was, she forked out, and he took it, and off he went, and has never been heard of from that day to this. Pretty mean, I call it. Good heavens, I exclaimed. My friend Hastings is shocked, remarked Poirot. You must be more careful, mademoiselle. He is out of date, you comprehend. He has just returned from those great clear open spaces, etc., and he has yet to learn the language of nowadays. Well, there's nothing to get shocked about, said Nick, opening her eyes very wide. I mean, everybody knows, don't they, that there are such people. But I call it a low-down trick all the same. Poor old Freddy was so damned hard up at the time, she didn't know where to turn. Yes, yes, not a very pretty affair. And your other friend, mademoiselle? The good Commander Challenger. George? Oh, I've known George all my life. Well, for the last five years, anyway. He's a good scout, George. He wishes you to marry him, ma? Well, he does mention it now and again, in the small hours of the morning, or after the second glass of port. But you remain hard-hearted. What would be the use of George and me marrying one another? We've neither of us got a bean. And one would get terribly bored with George, that playing for one side, good old school manner, after all, he's forty of his a day. The remark made me wince slightly. In fact, he has one foot in the grave, said Poirot. Oh, don't mind me, mademoiselle. I am a grandpapa, a nobody. And now, tell me more about these accidents. The picture, for instance. Oh, it's been hung up again, on a new cord. You can come and see it, if you like. She led the way out of the room, and we followed her. The picture in question was an oil painting, in a heavy frame. It hung directly over the bedhead. With a murmured, Are You permit, mademoiselle? Poirot removed his shoes and mounted upon the bed. He examined the picture and the cord, and gingerly tested the weight of the painting. With an elegant grimace, he descended. To have that descend on one's head, no, it would not be pretty. The cord by which it was hung, mademoiselle, was it uh, like this one? A wire cable? Yes, but not so thick. I got a thicker one this time. That is comprehensible. And you examined the break. The edges were frayed? I think so, but I didn't notice particularly. Why should I? Exactly as you say. Why should you? All the same, I should much like to look at that piece of wire. It is about the house anywhere? It was still on the picture. I expect the man who put the new wire on just threw the old one away. A pity. I should like to have seen it. You don't think it was just an accident after all? Surely it couldn't have been anything else. It may have been an accident, it is impossible to say, but the damage to the brakes of your car, that was not an accident. And the stone that rolled down the cliff, I should like to see the spot where that accident occurred. Nick took us out in the garden and led us to the cliff edge. The sea glittered blue below us. A rough path led down the face of the rock, Nick described just where the accident occurred, and Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Then he asked, How many ways are there into your garden, mademoiselle? Well, there's the front way, past the lodge, and a tradesman's entrance, a door in the wall halfway up that lane. Then there's a gate just along here on the cliff edge. It leads out onto a zigzag path that leads up from that beach to the Majestic Hotel, 
and then, of course, you can go straight through a gap in a hedge into the majestic garden. That's the way I went this morning. To go through the majestic garden is a shortcut to the town anyway. And your gardener? Where does he usually work? Well, he usually potters around the kitchen garden, or else he sits in the potting shed and pretends to be sharpening the shears. Around the other side of the house, that is to say. So that if anyone were to come in here and dislodge a boulder, he would be very unlikely to be noticed. Nick gave a sudden little shiver. Do you... do you really think that that is what happened? she asked. I, I can't believe it somehow. It seems so perfectly futile. Poirot drew the bullet from his pocket again and looked at it. That was not futile, mademoiselle, he said gently. He must have been some madman. Possibly. It is an interesting subject of after-dinner conversation. Are all criminals really madmen? There may be a malformation in their little grey cells. Yes, it is very likely. That, it is the affair of the doctor. For me, I have different work to perform. I have the innocent to think of, not the guilty. The victim, not the criminal. It is you I am considering now, mademoiselle, not your unknown assailant. You are young and beautiful, and the sun shines, and the world is pleasant, and there is life and love ahead of you. It is all that of which I think, mademoiselle. Tell me, these friends of yours, Mrs. Rice and Mr. Lazarus, they have been down here how long? Uh, Freddy came down on Wednesday to this part of the world. She stopped with some people near Tavistock for a couple of nights. She came on here yesterday. Jim has been touring around, I believe. And Commander Challenger? Uh, he's at Devonport. He comes over in his car whenever he can, weekends mostly. Poirot nodded. We were walking back to the house. There was a silence, and then he said suddenly, Have you a friend whom you can trust, mademoiselle? Well, there's Freddy. Other than Mrs. Rice. Well, I don't know. I suppose I have. Why? Because I want you to have a friend to stay with you. Immediately. Oh. Nick seemed rather taken aback. She was silent a moment or two, thinking. Then she said doubtfully, Well, there's Maggie. I could get hold of her, I expect. Who is Maggie? One of my Yorkshire cousins. There's a large family of them. He's a clergyman, you know. Maggie's about my age, and I usually have her to stay sometime or other in the summer. She's no fun, though. One of those painfully pure girls with the kind of hair that has just become fashionable by accident. I was hoping to get out of having her this year. Not at all. Your cousin, mademoiselle, will do admirably. Just the type of person I had in mind. All right, said Nick with a sigh. I'll wire her. I certainly don't know who else I could get hold of just now. Everyone's fixed up. But if it isn't the choir boy's outing or the mother's bean feast, she'll come all right. Though what you expect her to do... Could you arrange for her to sleep in your room? I suppose so. She would not think that an odd request? Oh, no, Maggie never thinks. She just does. Earnestly, you know. Christian works with faith and perseverance. All right. I'll wire her to come on Monday. Why not tomorrow? With Sunday trains? She'll think I'm dying if I suggest that. No, I'll say Monday. Are you going to tell her about the awful fate hanging over me? Nous verrons. You still make a jest of it. You have courage. I am glad to see that. It makes a diversion, anyway, said Nick. Something in her tone struck me, and I glanced at her curiously. I had the feeling that there was something she had left untold. We had re-entered the drawing-room. Poirot was fingering the newspaper on the sofa. You read this, mademoiselle? he asked suddenly. The St. Lou Herald? <laughs> Not seriously. I opened it to see the tides. It gives them every week. I see. By the way, mademoiselle, have you ever made a will? Uh, yes, yes, I did, about six months ago, just before my op. Qu'est-ce que vous dites? Your op? Operation. For appendicitis. Someone said I ought to make a will, so I did. It made me feel quite important. And the terms of that will? I left End House to Charles. I hadn't much else to leave, but what there was I left to Freddy. I should think probably the... what do you call them? Liabilities would have exceeded the assets, really. Poirot nodded absently. I will take my leave now. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Be careful. What of? asked Nick. You are intelligent. Yes, that is the weak point. 
In which direction are you to be careful? Who can say? But have confidence, mademoiselle. In a few days I shall have discovered the truth. Until then, beware of poison, bombs, revolver shots, motor accidents, and arrows dipped in the secret poison of the South American Indians, finished Nick glibly. Do not mock yourself, mademoiselle, said Poirot gravely. He paused as he reached the door. Oh, by the way, he said, what price did Monsieur Lazarus offer you for the portrait of your grandfather? Fifty pounds. Ah, said Poirot. He looked earnestly back at the dark, saturnine face above the mantelpiece. But as I told you, I don't want to sell the old boy. No, said Poirot thoughtfully. No, I understand. Chapter 4 There Must Be Something Poirot, I said, as soon as we were out upon the road, there is one thing I think you ought to know. And what is that, mon ami? I told him of Mrs. Rice's version of the trouble with the motor. Tiens, c'est intéressant, ça. There is, of course, a type, vain, hysterical, that seeks to make itself interesting by having marvellous escapes from death, and which will recount to you surprising histories that never happen. Yes, it is well known, that type there. Such people will even do themselves grave bodily injury to sustain the fiction. You don't think that, that Mademoiselle Nick is of that type? No, indeed. You observed, Hastings, that we had great difficulty in convincing her of her danger, and right to the end she kept up the farce of a half-mocking disbelief. She is of her generation, that little one. All the same, it is interesting what Madame Rice said. Why should she say it? Why say it, even if it were true? It was unnecessary, almost gauche. Yes, I said, that's true. She dragged it into the conversation neck and crop for no earthly reason that I could see. That is curious, yes, that is curious. The little facts, they are curious. I like to see them appear. They are significant. They point the way. The way? Where? You put your finger on the weak spot, my excellent Hastings. Where? Where indeed? Alas, we shall not know till we get there. Tell me, Poirot, I said, why did you insist on her getting this cousin to stay? Poirot stopped and waved an excited forefinger at me. Consider, he cried, consider for one little moment, Hastings, how we are handicapped. How are our hands tied? To hunt down a murderer after a crime has been committed, c'est tout simple. Or at least it is simple to one of my ability. The murderer has, so to speak, signed his name by committing the crime. But here there is no crime, and what is more, we do not want a crime. To detect a crime before it has been committed, that is indeed of a rare difficulty. What is our first aim? The safety of Mademoiselle, and that is not easy. No, it is not easy, Hastings. We cannot watch over her day and night. We cannot even send a policeman in big boots to watch over her. We cannot pass the night in a young lady's sleeping chamber. The affair bristles with difficulties. But we can do one thing. We can make it more difficult for our assassin. We can put Mademoiselle upon her guard, and we can introduce a perfectly impartial witness. It will take a very clever man to get round those two circumstances. He paused, and then said in an entirely different tone of voice, But what I am afraid of, Hastings, yes, what I am afraid of is that he is a very clever man. And I am not easy in my mind, no. I am not easy at all. Poirot, I said, you're making me feel quite nervous. So am I nervous. Listen, my friend, that paper, the St. Lou Weekly Herald, it was open and folded back at, where do you think? A little paragraph which said, Among the guests staying at the Majestic Hotel are Monsieur Hercule Poirot and Captain Hastings. Supposing, just supposing, that someone had read that paragraph. They know my name. Everyone knows my name. Miss Buckley didn't, I said with a grin. <laughs> she is a scatterbrain. She does not count. A serious man, a criminal, would know my name, and he would be afraid. He would wonder. He would ask himself questions. Three times he has attempted the life of Mademoiselle, and now Hercule Poirot arrives in the neighborhood. Is that coincidence? He would ask himself. And he would fear that it might not be coincidence. 
What would he do then? Or lie low and hide his tracks, I suggested. Yes, yes, or else, if he had real audacity, he would strike quickly, without loss of time. Before I had time to make inquiries, poof, Mademoiselle is dead. That is what a man of audacity would do. But why do you think that somebody read that paragraph other than Miss Buckley? It was not Miss Buckley who read the paragraph. When I mentioned my name, it meant nothing to her. It was not even familiar. Her face did not change. Besides, she told us she opened the paper to look at the tides, nothing else. Well, there was no tide table on that page. You think someone in the house, someone in the house or who has access to it? And that last is easy. The window stands open. Without doubt, Miss Buckley's friends pass in and out. Have you any idea? Any suspicion? Poirot flung out his hands. Nothing. Whatever the motive, it is, as I predicted, not an obvious one. That is the would-be murderer's security. That is why he could act so daringly this morning. On the face of it, no one seems to have any reason for desiring the little Nick's death. The property? And house? Well, that passes to the cousin. But does he particularly want a heavily mortgaged and very dilapidated old house? It is not even a family place so far as he is concerned. He is not a Buckley, remember. We must see this Charles Vise, certainly, but the idea seems fantastic. Then there is Madame, the bosom friend, with her strange eyes and her air of a lost Madonna. You felt that too? I asked, startled. What is her concern in the business? She tells you that her friend is a liar. C'est gentil, ça. Why does she tell you? Is she afraid of something that Nick may say? Is that something connected with the car? Or did she use that as an instance, and was her real fear of something else? Did anyone tamper with the car, and if so, who? And does she know about it? Then the handsome blonde, Monsieur Lazarus, where does he fit in, with his marvellous automobile and his money? Can he possibly be concerned in any way? Commander Challenger. Oh, he's all right, I put in quickly. I'm sure of that. A real pakasab. Doubtless, he has been to what you consider the right school. Happily being a foreigner, I am free from these prejudices and can make investigations unhampered by them. But I will admit that I find it hard to connect Commander Challenger with the case. In fact, I do not see that he can be connected. Well, of course he can't, I said warmly. Poirot looked at me meditatively. You have an extraordinary effect on me, Hastings. You have so strongly the flair in the wrong direction that I am almost tempted to go by it. You are that wholly admirable type of man, honest, credulous, honourable, who is invariably taken in by any scoundrel. You are the type of man who invests in doubtful oil fields and non-existent gold mines. From hundreds like you, the swindler makes his daily bread. Ah, well, I shall study this Commander Challenger. You have awakened my doubts. My dear Poirot, I cried angrily, you're perfectly absurd. A man who has knocked about the world like I have never learns, said Poirot sadly. It is amazing, but there it is. Do you suppose I'd have made a success of my ranch out in the Argentine if I were the kind of credulous fool you make out? Do not enrage yourself, mon ami. You have made a great success of it. You and your wife. Bella, I said, always goes by my judgment. She is as wise as she is charming, said Poirot. Let us not quarrel, my friend. See, si. there, ahead of us, it says Mott's Garage. That, I think, is the garage mentioned by Mademoiselle Buckley. A few inquiries will soon give us the truth of that little matter. We duly entered the place, and Poirot introduced himself by explaining that he had been recommended there by Miss Buckley. He made some inquiries about hiring a car for some afternoon drives, and from there slid easily into the topic of the damage sustained by Miss Buckley's car not long ago. Immediately the garage proprietor waxed voluble. Most extraordinary thing he'd ever seen. He then proceeded to be technical. I, alas, am not mechanically minded. Poirot.